Hello, and welcome to My Sex Bio's Fucking Capitalism. I'm your facilitator, Pierce Delahunt. Some context about today's one is that it came from a theme over a year ago. It's been planned to have a lesson on this. Last year was not my year, so I'm getting to it now. Thank you for attending. And usual caveats, I am a member of a variety of privileged groups. If you pay to attend the fucking capitalism workshops, that money does not go to me. That money goes to my sex bio's other staff and facilitators. The theme for this presentation is sex work, and we're going to get into that. I'm going to do the intro on political economy because it's going to come up in the way we talk about sex work. So we're going to start with that and then move into the theme. So political economy, real quick combination of politics and economics. Every political system is embedded into the economic system. Every economic system is embedded into the political system. Example of this is you have a contract between an employer and an employee. And if someone violates that contract, you need to call upon the state to enforce it. Broadly speaking, there are two different ways that a political economy can look. You have socialism on the left, capitalism on the right. Socialism is not just anything the government does, and capitalism is not just anything the business does. Socialism is when the workers control, and capitalism is when the owners control. And then that raises the question, control what? And the answer to that is that they are always in a tug of war tension for control over the means of production. What does that mean? Means of production can include land, education, materials, bodies, intellectual property, factories, etc. But often the primary thing that we're talking about is labor. For instance, if a person only has their labor to sell, then that means that they're in the working class, the proletariat. If a uh, person has other things to profit off of rather than their labor. And in fact, they use other people's labor to do work on the other things they own, whether that's land or factories and machines, etc. And then they profit off of those other people's labor, then that makes them a capitalist. A capitalist is not just anyone who believes in capitalism. A capitalist is someone who profits off of the labor of others because they own the means of production or private property. Getting into that, let's talk about more examples of means of production of private property. A personal property example is the house that you live in and personally use. That is not a means of production to you. Private property, which is synonymous with means of production under capitalism, is the house that you rent out and profit from. That house is a means of production to you. And you can see that there's a tension here that the same thing can be someone else's personal property and someone else's private property. So a uh, house is the personal property of the renter and the private property of the landlord. But because we're in my sex bio, we're also going to distinguish between socialist feminism and capitalist feminism. Now, capitalist feminism says as long as everyone has equal opportunity to climb the corporate ladder, regardless of sex and gender and other aspects of identity, then we've achieved feminism and equality. The corporate ladder is there for everyone, and that's all that we're responsible for. Socialist feminism, on the other hand, says we need to dismantle the ladder, change it into other things that are more useful for the rest of society. That metaphor meaning that we don't want any kind of corporate model at all. We don't want there to be the means for people to oppress workers, regardless of the gender, sex, or other aspects of identity of the boss, the capitalist in question. And that even if we did achieve some kind of equality of opportunity to climb the corporate ladder, which most socialist feminists would argue is never actually going to happen, then people being poor just in general is not something that we stand for. So distinguishing here between leftism and liberalism, liberalism being an inherently capitalist ideology, liberalism is the idea that no poor trans woman of color should die just because she is a trans woman of color. Dot, dot, dot implying that she can die because she's poor. That's the reason. Leftism says no one should die just because they're poor. In fact, we shouldn't even have poverty. And then the other thing I want to say on that is that both things are true, that there is a richer history and legacy of capitalists of oppressed identities sharing their wealth with their communities. And it is also true 
that a uh, woman of color run capitalism will never save all women of color just the way that today's white men run capitalism has not saved all white men. So that is a tension that leftism tries to resolve by saying no more capitalism. So moving forward from that, we're going to talk about labor theory of value. And this is where that particular class relation of political economy who's controlling the means of production is gonna become really important. So some historical background for the labor theory of value is that it was a popularly taught model of political economy, including through Adam Smith, who was nowhere near the right winger that he gets made out to be. But it was a popular theory of value and model right up until Marx took all of the work that came before him, including Adam Smith, and using the labor theory of value shows how capitalism creates the contradictions that will lead to its own collapse. And it was right at that point with the Marx's capital that more and more capitalist economists started ditching the labor theory of value because that meant that they had to answer to Marx and Marxism. So that's some of the historical context, but let's talk about what the labor theory of value actually is. Basically, it's just that all value comes from labor. That's not to say that all labor creates value necessarily, but all value is created by labor. You can have an idea and that's great, but it's only once you implement work to make that idea a reality that value is actually created. And there are certainly things like mental labor. Mental labor exists, emotional labor exists. Those are all real things, but it is the labor portion of them that create the value. So we're going to use just easy example. You have a worker in a factory and a capitalist could be a service worker, whatever the job of the worker is fine. But in this example, you have a worker who is creating value with their labor. They make the value. And in this example, we're going to say that they make the value of $25 per hour of their labor. That's the value that they make. And then the way that capitalism works is that that money or value, that value goes to the capitalist. And then it's on the capitalist to dispense that value back to the worker, because that's the way we have designed the system. The capitalist accumulates all of the value in the form of money, typically, and then hands it back to workers. Now, if you've ever heard the phrase, possession is nine-tenths of the law, you have a capitalist who has the value, the money already, and now they're deciding how much to give back. You can imagine they're not going to give back all of it. So they pay what is called a wage, but they keep what is called the profit. And this is why you can hear this from Richard Wolff, who says, the idea that you will ever be paid what you are worth is a lie under capitalism. Because if you are creating the value of $25 per hour for a capitalist, the capitalist will never agree to pay you that much or more. Because even if they were paying you just that much, they would be breaking even and they wouldn't be profiting off of your labor. And that's the whole point of being a capitalist is for them to profit off of your labor. So this is the labor theory of value in a nutshell. And part of the reason that I bring this up in the context of sex work is because the way that we talk about sex workers in part depends on whether they answer to a quote unquote boss, pimp, manager, capitalist, etc., or whether they do not. If they do, we typically talk about them as a victim of an abusive boss. If they do not, we typically talk about them as misled and forced into a situation that they need a way out of, but in a different way than if they have an abusive boss. So that's the reason I bring it up here. But before we delve even more into that, which I do want to do, I also want to emphasize that I'm not kidding around when I say possessions nine tenths of the law. Wage theft, when employers steal from employees, is makes up more than twice the amount 
of all other theft. This graph comes from 2018. The numbers may have changed somewhat, but the scales are all going to maintain. You can see the different kinds of wage theft there are. We have minimum wage violations, which that alone makes up more than all other forms of theft combined. Then you have overtime violations, rest break violations, off the clock violations. And then the other types of theft, you have larceny, burglary, auto theft, and robbery. What gets media attention though? How many times do we see stories about robberies and burglaries compared to how many times do we see a story about minimum wage violation? The asterisk that I want to put on this is that the other kind of theft that is not accounted for here, which is greater than wage theft, is land theft. And I don't want to erase that. That's really important. So I'm going to name it here. Land theft is the greatest form of theft, and then wage theft is next. Of course, how many stories in mainstream capitalist media do we see about land theft as well? So land theft and wage theft, land and labor are the two most stolen things under capitalism. So that is going to inform also the way that we talk about sex work. Just as with any other kind of work, sex workers are subject to employers stealing from their labor and profiting off of their labor. That is a true thing. And a lot of the way that people talk about sex work is as though that is the only case where that becomes true. That's the only time that people care about that kind of abuse happening is when it's sex work. And that kind of framing only serves to stigmatize sex workers and to rally efforts for criminalization of sex work. And we're going to get into that. So. Firstly, what do we mean when we talk about sex work, the work of sex work? Sex work is a big umbrella, often, in fact, represented symbolically as a red umbrella. So what falls under this red umbrella of sex work? These are just examples, but often people are referring to a wide variety of things when they mean sex work. It is also true that often people are referring specifically to full service sex work, which is, you know, paying for intercourse. But then there are all kinds of other sex work that people can be referring to under this big red umbrella. So these are some examples. If you're not familiar with some of these sugaring is typically sugar daddies and sugar babies and the sugar daddy is paying for a variety of things sometimes that goes into paying for education paying for college in exchange for some kind of sexual services whether that is escorting or whether that is full service intercourse and one example of sex work that is not explicitly named in this illustration is sexological body work now, sexological bodywork can look a lot of different ways. It can be everything from a Reiki massage where there's no physical touch to more physical contact. But sexological bodywork is a broad umbrella itself that includes a variety of therapeutic modalities that can be really healing. It is considered healing work. Those things are affected by the laws around sex work, the rhetoric around sex work. So it is also important to make sure that we are considering sexological body work in these conversations because they will be affected by the way we talk about them and the laws that get passed about sex work as a result. So these are some of the examples. There are a lot of different angles and intersections in how we talk about sex work and in everything that goes into sex work. So what is sex work? Well, it's a service industry, right? It's not paying for a product. In fact, if you are paying for a person, that would actually fall under chattel slavery. And that is something that does have intersection with sex work. And people often talk about sex work as though that is the only kind of that exists. Then intersectionally, often when we're talking about sex work, we are talking about trans and queer people of color, not exclusively, but there's a big overlap there. And it's important to acknowledge that and name that. And then we have this concept of a sex worker who has a boss or a pimp or a manager. Those sex workers are often talked about as though their employers are predators, often in a way that suggests that other employers are not also predators. And when we other sex work like that, that's when we contribute to the stigmatization of sex workers. And again, the only thing that does is make life harder for sex workers 
as well as in conjunction with contributing to the public support for criminalization of sex work. And we're going to get more into the criminalization component in the next slide. And if they don't have that boss again, then we often talk about them as though they are misguided in their attempt for independence. And we more pathologize them rather than infantilizing them with a single story about their victimhood. Going through the list here on the left, you might have heard the phrase sex work is work. Sex work is work is a claim that sex workers deserve and need workers' rights. And just like every other field of work, that workers' rights are human rights and sex workers are humans and workers and that those things go hand in hand. So the fight for more agency for sex workers is in tandem with the fight for workers' rights. Those things are going to work together. And again, consent, going back into the ways that we talk about sex work. And one point that I want to make with that is that we often refer to abusive sex work as human trafficking, which is not wholly inaccurate. And there's a way that that can conflate and blend things that have more nuance and distinction around them. One of the things that I'm thinking of right now is that the act of trafficking is the smuggling component, right? And most people who are trafficked, which is to say most people who are smuggled, they want to be smuggled. It's the part where they are kept captive afterward. That's the part that they don't want. And oftentimes it's a bait and switch. Most people who are smuggled are trying to cross a border. That's what I'm getting at. Then they learn that now they are indebted to their traffickers, their smugglers. But we often use the phrase human trafficking as though the trafficking is the problem. And I myself have done that plenty of times. But the part that is the problem is the control of the person afterward, if that makes sense. I think the really obvious way to deal with that situation is to allow for more freedom of movement. I would say abolish borders, but that is another long-term intersectional struggle. And again, consent, the more workers' rights that sex workers have, the more capacity they have to consent, the more they can resist bosses who are abusive, the more they can resist people who are trying to control their movement, whether those people are traffickers or not, and the more liberation there is for everyone. But oftentimes the way that sex work gets talked about is as though sex workers are unable to consent at any level. And I think there's a way that we talk about consent that can sound very binary. And there is a way that we can work on consent at a systemic scale that I think necessitates an understanding of consent as on a spectrum. If you've ever heard enthusiastic consent as a phrase, that I think is indicative of consent not being a binary. If there were just the binary of consent or not consent, then there would be no such thing as enthusiastic consent. And there are now calls for using the model of authentic consent rather than enthusiastic consent because authentic consent is more inclusive of sex workers and enthusiastic consent suggests that everyone needs to be enthusiastic about their jobs or rather it suggests that only sex workers need to be enthusiastic about their jobs and no one else, which is often the way that people talk about sex work is othering that work in a way that stigmatizes it from all other work. And then putting out here some terminology, if you're not familiar, TERF is probably much more known as a phrase, which stands for trans exclusionary radical feminist. And then the flip of that is sex worker exclusionary radical feminist or sex work exclusionary radical feminist. So people will group them together and call them swerf and turf, which is a funny phrase. And I would suggest that if your feminism is trans exclusive or sex worker exclusive, then I personally wouldn't call that feminism. I would say that those phrases are euphemisms. Like I think turf is a euphemism for transphobe and I guess swerf would then be a euphemism for sex worker phobe. One thing I do want to say here is that I know in my life, people who are dedicated leftists whom I love and value and appreciate 
who have more of an abolition position on sex work. And we're going to talk about that. I think just to name it briefly, that the position of abolition with regard to sex work is a careful one, but not an impossible one. But we're going to talk about that with the next slide going into criminalization. So here we have models of law regarding sex work, and we're going to go through the different levels of the models of law. Some imagery here for you, again, alluding to the kinds of things I was talking about earlier. Sex workers' rights are human rights. Sex workers work. Sex workers' rights are workers' rights those kinds of themes. But regarding the models of law, we're probably most familiar with full criminalization. Every aspect, every person involved is treated criminally, treated like a criminal, is criminalized. So you have the sex worker themselves, as well as the person paying for the services, as well as if there is such a person, the manager or boss or pimp, etc. So every person involved in that interaction is criminalized and every action involved is criminalized. And then you have a step down from that is partial criminalization. So for instance, maybe a given region criminalizes full-on intercourse, but not other aspects of sex work. For instance, there are different degrees and models of partial criminalization. Then a step down from that is the criminalization of just the clients and or the bosses. So not the sex workers themselves get criminalized. It would just be the person paying for the services or the boss or the manager or the pimp, etc. And this model is often called the Nordic model. That is one model of law regarding sex work. And then you have the model of legalization, which if you're familiar with drug law models, it's very similar in that the sex work is legal, but comes with regulations. You have to have a license. You have to work through official channels, that kind of thing compared to decriminalization, which again is a popular model under drug law, that there'd be no need for the regulations or the licensing or going through official channels. Anyone can do sex work and anyone can pay for sex work, that kind of thing. So those are the different models. Now, one thing that I want to emphasize here is that abolition is a vision. Abolition is a goal that some people have. Abolition is a desire that some people have, but abolition is not a model of law. This is where the nuance around abolition becomes really important, is that a given person who believes in abolition regarding sex work needs to name their model of law, because that is the part that is going to affect the lives of sex workers. If, for instance, their position is an abolition of sex work via the full criminalization of all aspects of sex work, if that is the way that they want to achieve the abolition of sex work, which is by far the most common position of abolition, at least in the US, then that is their position is full criminalization. And that one I consider to be extremely problematic. And I do know people who hold a position of abolition who want to achieve the abolition of sex work through other means, namely through resourcing sex workers by providing for everyone's means of livelihood so that they do not need to engage in sex work in order to get their needs met, in order to afford shelter and groceries, etc. And the risk in that position is that in advocating for abolition, the pro-criminalization movement will co-opt that. That is a risk. So if you hold a position of abolition but don't want to criminalize sex workers, it is extremely important that you name that and emphasize that. And I would argue that given our current models of power, as well as the general climate and attitudes around sex work and sex workers, that the fight for destigmatization and decriminalization is actually far more important and does more for sex workers than the fight for abolition for its own sake. And there will be resources provided from actual sex workers who can speak to that. But that is a thing that I want to name as being a really important nuance. One sex worker that you'll see in the resources has the line here, prohibiting the sex industry exacerbates every harm that sex workers are vulnerable to. 
think as a concrete example of how even what's called the Nordic model or the criminalization of just clients and bosses can be problematic for the actual sex workers is that you can imagine being a sex worker and wanting to vet your clients to make sure that they're not abusive. But if your clients are going to be cagey about it, because they don't know whether you're a cop or what cops might be listening in on them, then that makes it harder for sex workers to vet clients. So that's just one way that even the Nordic model, the criminalization of clients and bosses makes life harder for sex workers. Using the Nordic model, law enforcement is still likely to treat a sex worker as a criminal given a situation where sex workers are working together in what would be framed as a worker co-op, law enforcement is going to treat those workers as managers and therefore criminalize them. Because they are helping each other out, they are seen as enabling, they are seen as the managers of each other. They are co-managing. Remember, under a worker co-op, every worker is an owner and every owner is a worker. In that model, if you are an owner, then you get criminalized. That's the boss position, the manager position, the pimp position. And if you are a sex worker helping out another sex worker, perhaps by allowing a sex worker a safe space in your apartment, then you get criminalized too. And so that is one example of how even the Nordic model does not contribute to the safety of sex workers because law enforcement is not going to treat sex workers as distinct from clients and bosses. Again, more resources that will point to that. And then also regarding legalization versus decriminalization, if you're familiar with this conversation in drug law, then you're familiar that legalization is a lot of classist gatekeeping that often comes out in super problematic ways that prevents people from finding that way to provide for their livelihood. If you are trying to protect sex workers, then the thing you do not want to do is criminalize them or the people that they are in relationship with. That just makes their lives harder. And sex workers will speak to that across the board, and I'll point you to those resources. Part of the reason that I am emphasizing this is that I am seeing on my own side, a resurgence in the position of abolition. I am seeing a resurgence in a targeted critique of sex work, sometimes with really good analysis, sometimes from really caring people. And I believe their analysis and I believe their care. And that conversation can very easily be co-opted by the pro-criminalization movement. To use an example that I think maybe makes more intuitive sense to most leftists is that in the climate and power structure of the world today, if a U.S. citizen, super grounded leftist, gives a really grounded, principled critique of Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, really grounded in leftist critique and analysis, but does not offer a concrete alternative of what to do with that analysis, it is just going to get co-opted by the movements to go to war with those countries or to overthrow those countries or to somehow disrupt those countries with U.S. intervention. Because that is the dominant way to deal with those countries from that positionality. Similarly, if we are offering some kind of critique of the sex work industry without naming a clear alternative of what to do about that, then that is only going to serve that stigmatization and criminalization effort. So if you were attending the live fucking capitalism workshop, we would have breakout sessions where we would go through these reflection questions. But here I just leave these questions for you, as well as the tree of contemplative practices. I put this up because I think it is important to name that not everyone does their best contemplation in stillness contemplation, which I think dominates the way we think about contemplation. I, for instance, do really well with movement contemplation. I know other people who do really well with creative contemplation. So I offer the tree of contemplative practices as a way for you to consider other forms of contemplation. But I do think whatever form your contemplation of preference, that it is important for us 
to be in contemplation in conversation with each other. That can be on your own at first, but that we have these conversations, all of us together in some capacity or another. So the first question that I offer to y'all is, how do I relate to and or advocate for those who work for me? Anyone in the service industry whose services you benefit from, how do I relate to those people? And do I think of sex workers as distinct from those people in some way and why? And I'm asking you to delve into the nuances there and consider where those nuances are coming from. And then next question, how do I provide and or receive sexual effort? Maybe you don't frequent sex workers, but in your sexuality, whatever that sexuality is, what is your relationship to sexual work? How much do you do sexual work compared to how much do you receive sexual work? And what does that mean? And how do you get quote unquote, compensated for that? And or how do you compensate others for that? Maybe it's not in a strict financial transaction, but using that kind of frame, what insights might you learn from that? And then I offer the quotation from radical educator John Dewey, we don't just learn from experiences, we learn from reflecting on the experience. So that's the presentation. I'm going to walk you through some of these resources. As usual, the lower left are all of the go-tos for the conversation of sex and socialism in a general kind of way. Really strongly recommend, especially regarding the labor theories of value, the 21st Century Socialism Richard Wolff video and the Marxist Capital Illustrated comic book. And then regarding the resources on the right over here, we have a variety of things. If you care about sex workers, one of the best things that you can do is fund them. And that doesn't have to be by buying their services. It can be by giving to this sex worker giving circle. If you're not familiar with what a giving circle is, rather than, for instance, I donate to a particular person or org, I give to a giving circle and the giving circle decides what to do with that money. And so a sex worker giving circle is a giving circle made up of sex workers. And sex workers have been funding each other and helping each other out ever since there've been sex workers. So I don't claim to know what's the best thing to do for sex workers and where my money should go. But if I give my money to a giving circle made up of sex workers, then those sex workers can decide what is the best thing to do with that money and how will it best help and empower sex workers. Then I offer an article as well as a string of videos for you to look through. Lots of really good TED Talks from actual sex workers, lots of good histories and analyses all kinds of things there. I really encourage you to go through these resources and to give what you can. Learning about these issues is really helpful, not just for you and your own radicalization and your own education, but really helpful for sex workers. Whatever people you care about, it is important to develop relationships with them and to listen to them and to learn from them. And so these are some resources, many of which come from actual sex workers, not all of them, but they all take the work of sex workers in order to create that content. And then here are some sex worker social media things to get you again, more embedded into relationship with sex workers. I strongly recommend if you're on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or any of the things, follow sex workers because they are having these conversations and it's really important to be learning from them and listening to them. Thank you again. This has been My Sex Bio's Fucking Capitalism. I am your facilitator, Pierce Delahunt, and I encourage you to check out My Sex Bio's other resources and other classes. I encourage you to reach out to me for any questions. I encourage you to delve more deeply into these resources if you have any questions. And I really appreciate your listening and thank you for your time and attention.